Kia Sportage asks more searching questions of its family SUV rivals in this more dynamic looking fifth generation form. There's a more upmarket look and feel, more electrified engine technology, more of everything really. Well, except full electric power and real off-road ability anyway. Kia's Sportage is one of the most prolifically selling cars South Korea has ever brought us. Europe likes this model line very much, which is why Europe has been given its own bespoke version of this car in this fifth generation guise. In place of the long wheelbase version sold in other world markets, our continent gets this shorter, sportier looking version of the Mark V design, which apparently has been tuned for our roads as well as for our preference in the size of our Qashqai class family SUVs. It's got quite a heritage of sales success to build on to the point where today, globally, a Sportage is sold to someone every 69 seconds. It all seems a very long way from the model line's quirky beginnings back in 1993 with a Mark I NB series Sportage design based on a Mazda Bongo van. Its JEKM series replacement, introduced in 2004, gained more of the sales foothold, but it wasn't until the launch of the third generation SL series version in 2010 that European customers really started taking this Sportage seriously. More than any other car that Kia has made, that Mark III design was the one most influential in turning around the fortunes of the brand, to the point where by the time of the launch of its fourth generation successor in early 2016, the Sportage was accounting for nearly a third of the brand's total sales volume in this country. That QL series Mark IV model, usefully updated in 2018, went on to sell nearly 200,000 examples, taking total Sportage sales in our market to over a third of a million. In 2021, its last year on sale, it was our country's ninth best-selling car. It's long been Kia's UK bestseller. In a bid to move things further forward once more, this fifth generation NQ5 series version, announced early in 2022, arrived with two characteristics new to this model line, flair and personality. Well, it's certainly the most daringly styled Sportage yet, both inside and out, with much borrowed from the Kia's all-electric EV6, a similarly sized model which relieves the brand of the need to provide a full battery version of this crossover. Mind you, it's possible to have just about anything else electrified beneath the bonnet, thanks to engineering shared across the board with this car's competitor and close cousin, the Hyundai Tucson. Petrol, diesel, mild hybrid, full hybrid or plug-in hybrid, take your pick. So, can this Mark V Sportage model continue the prolific sales success of its immediate predecessors? And more importantly, is it still a contender you just can't ignore if you're looking for a mainstream Qashqai class family five-seat SUV? Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. So, how do you write a bestseller? We're about to find out. Most of the headlines around this fifth generation Sportage model tend to centre on the way that it's been re-engineered for a more efficient future. Yet, most models, for all their newfangled electrification, are primarily powered by a 1.6 litre T GDI petrol engine that's been offered to Sportage customers since 2016 and wasn't particularly frugal by class standards even back then. You might also question the futuristic claims of a model that still expects to sell in significant numbers with diesel power. In a market where black pump fueled engines are rapidly falling from favour. Clearly though, Kia knows what it's doing, given the way that sales of this model line have so significantly trounced most competitors over the last few years. The avant-garde cabin you get this time round certainly exudes confidence, so we'll give this growing Korean brand the benefit of the doubt. Press the starter button and see what this fifth chapter of the Sportage saga has to offer. A touch ironically given the model name, this Sportage isn't particularly sporty to drive. There's something that hasn't changed. But if you're a typical prospective customer, you won't be too bothered about that. You sit quite high, 
The ride's a fraction on the firm side and body rolls quite well controlled, though not to the point where you might be encouraged to test out the car's handling limits were you to be running late for the school run or ballet lesson or rugby practice or that long postponed dinner date with your partner that delays leaving the office have now put in jeopardy. Delete as appropriate. The touch disappointingly given the access to handling excellence it has through the sporting N division of the Hyundai Motor Group, Kia hasn't really moved the game on much in this regard with this Mark V model. So if you want a more engaging family SUV of this sort, we'd suggest you try a Ford Cougar or a Mazda CX-5. The budget in this case has instead primarily been devoted to bringing Sportage customers a really impressive array of engine choice that will determine just how serious you are about electrification in this kind of crossover. Kia can't appeal here to folk completely evangelical about EVs because no full battery version of this car is being offered. The brand's EV6 model scratches that itch. Just about every other conceivable form of powertrain is available though. Petrol, diesel, mild hybrid, full hybrid and plug-in hybrid. Take your pick. All the permutations can get a bit confusing, so we'll try and clarify it all for you. First, unlike its almost identically engineered close cousin, the Hyundai Tucson, this Sportage can still be had with a diesel engine, Kia's usual 1.6-litre CRDI unit. With manual transmission, this offers 113 bhp, but if you want it as an automatic, the same unit enjoys a power height to 136 bhp, gets embellished with 48 volt mild hybrid tech, and with top trim, can be had with the option of four-wheel drive. That faster, also diesel model offers 320 newton meters of pulling power, nearly 30% more grunt through the gears than the equivalent petrol version, so you might be tempted by that. Otherwise, though, you'll probably be choosing a version of this Kia with some flavor of 1.6 liter TGDI petrol powertrain, and as we intimated earlier, there are quite a few. Shortly, we'll brief you on how this engine works with full hybrid, or HEV, and plug-in hybrid, or PHEV, electrification. But it's worth mentioning at the outset that at the foot of the Sportage range, you can have that 1.6-litre T GDI petrol power plant rather more simply in its more affordable form with manual transmission, a 148 bhp output, and no electrification at all. In that guise, it manages 60 miles an hour in 9.9 .9 seconds en route to 113 miles an hour, which on paper at least is significantly quicker than both the black pump fueled models. As with the base diesel, opting for this base petrol unit with Kia's 7-speed DCT auto gearbox lucks you into the extra benefit of the brand's 48-volt mild hybrid tech, which again, only with top trim, you can opt to have combined with four-wheel drive. It's actually that 1.6 TGDI 48 volt DCT all wheel drive package we've chosen to try here. Lots of acronyms there, but a simple end result. A family SUV that in this test form has a modest turn of pace, 60 miles an hour in 9.4 seconds on the way to 117 miles an hour, but an easy going character. As usual though, with a mild hybrid model, significant electrified benefits are difficult to discern either at the wheel or, as we'll see later in this film, in the efficiency readings, primarily because MHEV engines of this sort can never run independently on full battery power. The tiny battery you do get merely runs the engine start-stop system, powers a few auxiliary functions and reclaims energy that also adds a fraction more mid-range pulling power. Ultimately, though, for electrified engine technology that'll really make a proper difference to your Sportage, you'll need some sort of full hybrid powertrain. Your options for that, beginning with the HEV hybrid model, offered in this case with the choice of two-wheel drive or 4x4 drivetrains. Here, a Prius-style self-charging petrol electric engine working with six-speed auto gearbox is mated to a 60 bhp electric motor powered by a 1.49 kilowatt-hour battery, 
which provides sufficient extra urge to up the combined power output to 226 horsepower and produce 350 newton meters of torque. All enough to improve the 62 mile an hour sprint stat to 7.7 seconds, it's 8 seconds for the 4x4 version, and the top speed to 120 miles an hour. Although the battery on offer in a Sportage HEV isn't very big, it's very good at constantly replenishing itself with regenerative energy, so that much of the time in town travel you'll be able to cruise through the urban sprawl in a dignified silence. You can leave the powertrain to do its own thing or use a center console HEV or EV button to make your own choice between full hybrid or full electric motion, though the latter won't last for very long. You might not be quite so impressed out of town. The self-charging full hybrid system adds 69 kilos of weight, enough to see a well-equipped Sportage HEV model tipping the scales at nearly 1.7 tonnes. Combining that with the electric motor's relatively feeble output can only have one result, a frequent propensity for the 1.6T GDI petrol unit to kick in, sometimes quite vocally, virtually all the time in usual driving. Once it has, should there be a need for more urgent forward thrust, then a prod of the throttle is accompanied by a pleasing initial stab of electrified torque, but this doesn't last for long because torque is more restricted than it would be with a comparably powerful diesel-engined rival. Which is also why Sportage models are also relatively restricted when it comes to towing capacity. Whereas a typical black pump fueled rival, say a Volkswagen Tiguan 2 litre TDI 150 PS model for instance, can lug along a couple of tonnes, the across the range Sportage figure is limited to 1,650 kilos. Unless, that is, you happen to have opted for the plug-in hybrid version of this gear, in which case it falls to just 1,350 kilos. Ah yes, the plug-in model, a variant the Korean maker only offers with a 4x4 drivetrain. In PHEV form, this Sportage takes the same engine and six-speed auto transmission combo as is used in the HEV full hybrid, then makes it all to a somewhat gutsier 90 bhp electric motor powered by a considerably bigger 13.8 kilowatt hour battery pack. When fully charged, this is supposed to be able to provide for up to 43 miles of all-electric driving, which rather impressively is five more miles than the identically engineered Hyundai Tucson plug-in hybrid can manage. Better still, you can get reasonably close to that range figure in normal day-to-day -day use, after which the 1.6-litre T GDI seamlessly cuts in, with a fraction more vigour than with the HEV model, thanks to this PHEV variant's higher 261 bhp combined output. That isn't enough to improve performance. The figures rest to 62 miles an hour in 7.9 seconds en route to 119 miles an hour are about the same as those we've just quoted for the HEV variant. That's because, of course, with this plug-in derivative, there's even more weight, 190 kilos more of it, to lug about. Still, you wouldn't really want to go any faster than that in a car like this. Particularly one that, as we suggested earlier, isn't really tuned for a particularly involving handling experience. If you do want to press on, switching out of the car's normal or eco drive select settings to a more decisive sport mode makes a big difference to throttle response while firming up the steering and quickening changes from the auto transmission. It can't firm up the damping though because the adaptive electronic control suspension system that Kia offers on this car in other markets can't be had in the UK, though interestingly you can have it here as an option on this car's identically engineered Hyundai Tucson close cousin. We doubt though that you would normally want the ride to be much firmer than it already is. As it is, poorer sections of tarmac and speed humps unsettle the car a touch more than we'd ideally like. We doubt also that in any Sportage you'll want to use the sport setting very frequently. There's really not much to be gained from trying to hustle a relatively high-sided SUV weighing the best part of two tonnes quickly through tight turns, though body stability is aided by this fifth generation design's adoption of a stiffer, more rigid N3 platform. Overall though, 
for turning traction at speed, this Sportage tends to rely heavily on electronic stability intervention and if fitted on its four-wheel drive system. Rival German premium brand models do better, but they're not quite as capable as a four-wheel drive version of this Kia would be for light off-road excursions. On a 4x4 48-volt Sportage derivative like this one, the drive mode switch gains a locking differential button, and on HEV and PHEV models, you get a separate terrain section with three extra settings of the sort you wouldn't previously have seen on a Sportage, snow, mud and sand. These adapt the gearbox shift times and the four-wheel drive system to help the car find and maintain traction on low grip surfaces. And there's downhill brake control to ease you down slippery slopes. But there's not really enough ride height to venture anywhere too gnarly with this Kia, so the terrain side of the drive mode dial will probably remain largely unused. As is usual in the class, the AWD system is very much tarmac orientated, one of those that keeps you front driven most of the time, but when traction fails, can instantly send up to 40% of torque to the rear axle. Of much more interest to likely owners will be this Kia's cruising demeanour, particularly its improved refinement at speed. With automatic transmission, you're even offered a degree of autonomous assistance, courtesy of the brand's latest highway driving assist setup, which works with the smart cruise control system to control steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane while keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead. And it'll automatically control your speed according to prevailing limits. It's another example of the kind of sophistication the Korean maker thinks this model line is now ready for. Whether customers will be equally ready to pay the price tag that goes along with that technology is another question, of course. Which is where this fifth generation Sportage's more appealing packaging comes in, which will probably be enough to keep it as a staple of the school run. Ultimately, this car has become an accomplished and very European feeling package, which of course is exactly what the Korean brand was after. Going forward, Kia feels ready to be assertive and a little more daring in the way it styles its cars. Sure enough, this fifth generation Sportage makes its predecessors look very conservative indeed, like the second generation Nero crossover and the all-electric EV6 created using a more individual design language the brand calls Opposite United. You'll either like it or you won't, but if you do, you'll probably not like anything else in this class quite as much. That's presumably the idea. For us, this profile perspective shows the car off at its best. The tape measure reveals a 30 millimetre length increase this time round, but it looks even longer, primarily because of everything that's going on back here around the C and D pillars. The kicked up chrome belt line and the separate crease that flows from the tail lamp before disappearing above the rear door handle. The crossover cues are subtle. The lightly emphasised wheel arches, the angled lower sill and the sleek roof rails. And of course there are big wheels between 17 and 19 inches in size. We've got 19 inches here. And even larger long wheelbase versions on sale in other markets, but you can see why Kia doesn't feel the need for it here. All the main talking points, though, are here at the front, which links the brand's signature tiger nose grille to these distinctive, futuristically styled boomerang-shaped LED daytime running lights, which in turn create boundary lines for the unusually shaped LED headlamps, which feature intelligent matrix technology further up the range. This lower intake is framed at the bottom by a subtle silver skid plate, and at the sides by silver tusk-like panels that each angle up towards the number plate. Whatever you think about the whole effect, you can't deny that it gives the car overtaking presence. The rear makes a statement too, with a muscular, swooping fastback design that flows into the rear lights. These crafted to give the impression that they cut into the body with fine precision. 
A slim horizontal design connects these so-called razor lamps, emphasising this fifth generation model's 10mm increase in width. Under the skin lies the same sophisticated new N3 platform that undergirds both this model's similarly engineered close cousin, the Hyundai Tucson, and Kia's larger Sorento SUV. So, this fifth generation Sportage is very different outside to anything we've seen before. Will the interior be equally changed? Absolutely. The front of cabin experience this time round shares nothing at all with this model's predecessor. Whether you'll like it will depend on how much you appreciate more futuristic design. The fascia dominated at the top of the range by these two high-definition 12.3-inch displays, bonded together behind a curved screen and bracketed at either end by these unusual fin-shaped vertical vents. There's also lots else that's new. This little central panel, whose functions alternate between shortcut infotainment buttons and climate controls at the flip of a switch, Cup holder stays that appear at the press of another button and this tiny shift-by-wire auto transmission dial. It's all the kind of bold design ingenuity you'd once have needed a premium brand for. Now you can get it on a Kia. You sit a bit higher than the SUV segment norm, which is no bad thing, and the Korean makers tried to justify this model line's significantly higher price positioning with a little more luxury too. The finely detailed metal trimming on the air vents, the soft leather on the flat-bottomed steering wheel, and on this top-spec GT Line S variant, supportive seats trimmed in premium dark suede and leather, plus a black headliner and suede trim inserts throughout. Would you really rather spend the same money on a premium brand model with stripped-out standards of spec? But that, of course, is the argument advanced by premium spec versions of every mainstream family SUV in this segment. This one depends a lot on sophisticated screen tech to set itself apart, which you might want to be aware that you don't completely get further down the Sportage range. With the more affordable base 2 spec and GT line trim variants many customers will be choosing, you're given old-fashioned analogue dials and with 2-spec you don't get this 12.3-inch GPS embellished central screen either. Just a smaller 8-inch display without navigation. That's it for the caveats though and provided you've bought into a mid or top-spec version of this car, you'll enjoy this test car's smart setup. The curved screen display with its twin 12.3-inch bonded monitors that we referenced earlier. We'll start with the central infotainment screen, which does most of the usual stuff really well. We mentioned that navigation standard with this bigger monitor. And as with all Sportage variants, the expected Apple CarPlay or Android Auto phone projection features are included too. Plus, with plusher trim, there's the kind of high-quality premium sound system that other brands would charge a lot more for. Here, it's a Harman Kardon branded DAB setup. We're not quite so keen on the added cloud-based natural language voice recognition system, which offers to tell you things like whether it's raining in London, but can't apparently manage something as basic as finding you a favourite radio station. If Kia really wants to tilt at prestige brands, it needs to develop properly responsive voice activation for its media tech. Swipe around other parts of this monitor and you'll find climate options plus a Kia Live section that can brief you on traffic flow and filling station info on your journey along with parking info for your destination. And there's also the brand's latest Kia Connect connectivity which offers a section with calendar, weather and vehicle diagnostic menus plus one you can set to enable you to follow the results of your favourite sports team. This all combines with a downloadable app, including a neat last mile navigation feature that, after you've parked at your destination, will continue guidance on your smartphone to your final destination address. This centre touchscreen has plenty of other nice touches too. A voice memo feature, allowing you to record your thoughts as you drive. And there's a quiet mode feature, which cuts off all the rear speakers and keeps the volume of the front ones down to a preset level. Handy for when children might be sleeping in the back. Yet, you don't want to miss that song or bit of the news you were listening to. There are some nice design touches too. At first glance, you might initially think that this central screen doesn't have 
any shortcut buttons for easy access to major functions. But actually, it does. They're hidden on this little narrow multi-mode display below the central vents, which flicks from ventilation functions to infotainment monitor shortcuts at the press of a button. Once you get used to it, the arrangement works well. Anything this centre stack monitor can't tell you, and much that it can, may also be viewed through that stitched leather steering wheel on the identically sized driver's supervision instrument cluster screen we mentioned earlier. This incorporates virtual dials, which change in colour according to selected drive mode, with a speedo on the left, and for hybrid and plug-in models, the right-hand rev counter replaced by a hybrid system indicator. Kia hasn't yet figured out how to incorporate full screen mapping into a display of this kind, so between the gauges, above an econometer readout band is a central information readout section you can format to show an energy flow monitor, trip computer data, a digital speedo, an attention level indicator, the prevailing speed limit, tyre pressures, a compass, or the tractional status of the four-wheel drive system if you happen to have it. Quite a lot then. Enough on media tech. What else might you need to know here? Well, earlier we mentioned the fact that the seating position is a little higher than the norm, though unfortunately that doesn't help with all-round visibility. Complicated a little by angled front A pillars and big rear corner pillars that'll have you making plenty of use of the standard rear view camera and all-round sensors when you're parking. All those touch sensitive switches can be fiddly both to locate and to use without taking your eyes off the road and the cabin's many shiny surfaces will quickly become smeared and or covered in dust or hairs. At least build quality seems solid, and there's lots of adjustment for both the wheel and the broad and generally very comfortable seats, which, above base trim, come with standard lumbar support, but could do with holding you in a little more firmly through the corners. What about storage space? Well, you'll probably put most things in this deep box between the seats, which we'd like better if it could be cooled or had connectivity ports within it. But at least it's lidded, like this stowage area at the base of the centre stack, which is where all the connectivity stuff resides. Twin USBs, a USB-A and a USB-C, plus a 12-volt socket, and on most models, a powerful 15-watt wireless charging mat. You get a large glove box, but an overhead sunglasses compartment has been forgotten. And the door pockets are on the small side. Twin cup holders with stays activated by the little buttons we mentioned earlier sit beside the gear shift selector and there are ticket clips in the sun visors. Time to take a look in the rear. Now the doors open really wide which will be helpful if you're a parent leaning in to strap up a child seat, which is a good start. Now, we mentioned this fifth generation model's small length increase earlier. Well, as part of that, it's gained another 10 millimetres of wheelbase length between the axles, all of which Kia promises will benefit folk at the back. So let's take a look. Certainly, the back seat now has a slightly more spacious area feel that's backed up by a measurement suggesting that passengers back here will now enjoy up to 996 millimetres of legroom with lots of space to slide your feet beneath the now slimmer front seats. There's near class leading headroom too with both attributes unaffected should you opt for either a full hybrid or a plug-in drivetrain though headspace will be slightly affected if you choose a top version like this one fitted with a panoramic glass roof. Other than that, we reckon a couple of six-footers would fit in quite comfortably, even with the front seat slid reasonably well back. The extra width of this fifth-generation design is also welcome, though, as usual in this class, adults won't want to occupy the middle berth on longer trips, despite the relatively low level of the centre transmission tunnel. It's a pity that the seat base doesn't slide in the way it does with some rivals, Volkswagen's Tiguan, for instance. In a rival Skoda Karok, you can even take the rear bench completely out. Kia's designers haven't bothered with any of that sort of flexibility here, but the backrest does at least recline for a little extra comfort on longer trips. Storage is at a bit of a premium back here. There are no proper storage bins built into the nicely trimmed door cards, only a holder on each side that can take a 500ml bottle. But there are seat back pockets, a central storage cubby and a useful USB-C socket on the side of each front seat. Plus there are useful coat hooks in the front seat backs 
and more usual ones on the overhead grab handles, which is where you'll find overhead lights. There are the usual cup holders in this pull-down armrest, and plusher models get three-zone climate controls and heated rear seats. We'll finish with a look in the boot, which unless you've splashed out on a top trim level like this one, you'll have to raise yourself. Where you do get this powered tailgate, it can activate with a swipe of your foot beneath the bumper for extra convenience should you find yourself approaching the car laden down with bags. The space you'll get once the tailgate's raised will depend a lot on the powertrain you've chosen for your Sportage. The Korean brand says that there's about 10% more room in the back here than there was with the previous generation model, but it's difficult to accurately verify that because the capacity figures vary quite a lot due to the fact that Kia hasn't been able to find a way of packaging powertrain electricals without affecting luggage space. The best you'll do is 591 litres, which is what you'll get with a conventional unelectrified 1.6T GDI petrol model, but that figure falls to 562 litres if you choose a mild hybrid 48-volt petrol model like this one. The unelectrified diesel model offers a 571-litre boot, a capacity figure that falls to 526 litres if you choose the more powerful diesel variant with 48-volt mild hybrid tech. This model's slightly boxier Hyundai Tucson Cousin betters these figures quite easily. A conventional unelectrified 1.6T GDI petrol Tucson, for instance, has a 620 litre boot. But you're much better off than you would be with a slightly smaller rival model in this segment, like, say, a Nissan Qashqai at 480 litres, or a Seat Attica at 510 litres. You might expect to get a little less cargo capacity in the HEV and PHEV versions of this car. Actually, with the HEV full hybrid, you do a bit better than with most of the ordinary combustion Sportage versions. There's 587 litres of space with either two-wheel drive or all-wheel drive variants. That falls to 540 litres if you choose the PHEV plug-in model. Still not bad by class standards though, a Peugeot 3008 hybrid plug-in model for instance only offers 395 litres. If you need to access the shallow area beneath the cargo area floor and use this deep storage well, that floor can be raised and clipped onto the base of the parcel shelf to keep it in place. No Sportage model bothers to offer any sort of space saver spare wheel down here. Always a disappointment on an SUV, but to be fair, there's no space for it on the PHEV variant, only compartments for the charging leads and the tyre inflation kit. You'd think the designers could have figured out a way to fit the tonneau cover under here when not in use, though. An adjustable height boot floor is also lacking, but you do get a useful 12-volt socket here on the left. On the plus side, the loading lip's pretty low and sits flush with the floor level, and the floor area is usefully wide. You get the usual couple of bag hooks and four tie-down points, and we're pleased to see a switch to a 40-20-40 split for the rear seat back, so longer items like skis can now be slid forward between a couple of rear-seated passengers. And, helpfully, the rear seat back rests can be made a little more upright for those times when you want to cram in suitcases, say, on an airport run. Handy levers positioned just inside the tailgate opening allow you to retract the rear bench completely, which folds almost flat and releases up to 1,780 litres of space in the unelectrified 1.6T GDI model, or 1,751 in this 48-volt petrol variant. It's 1,760 with the base unelectrified CRDI diesel, a figure that falls to 1,715 litres if you have that engine with the 48-volt tech. The HEV full hybrid petrol model offers up to 1,716 litres with all the seats folded, and with the PHEV plug-in version, the figure is up to 1,715 litres. Got all that? Good. There's no getting around it. Pricing is quite a bit higher than it used to be for a Sportage. From launch and at the time of this test in spring 2022, sitting in the £27,000 to £44,000 bracket. 
The full hybrid HEV variants start from around £33,000. The PHEV plug-in hybrids from around thirty-eight and a half. Still, at least there's no shortage of choice. Choose your powertrain, petrol, diesel, mild hybrid, full hybrid or plug-in hybrid. Then match it to your preferred spec level, the usual Kia 2, GT Line 3, 4 and GT Line S trim options. With so many different versions to choose from, there ought to be a Sportage for almost everyone. You've also really got to want a Sportage should you be coming in search of a mid-sized family-shaped Kia SUV because there are these days several other options if you happen to be visiting one of the company's showrooms in search of such a thing. A spend in the £28,000 to £33,000 bracket could get you the brand's slightly smaller SUV, the Nero, in 1.6-litre full hybrid HEV form. Or, if you're prepared to trade a little of this Sportage model space for extra electrification, a £32,000 to £35,000 spend would get you the brand's Exceed crossover model, complete with PHEV plug-in tech. Should you want a full EV, just about the only kind of powertrain this Sportage can't offer, around £35,000 would get you the brand's Nero EV and a spend from around £42,000, the cost of a plush Sportage PHEV would get you the Mark's trendier EV6, a kind of hatch come SUV that'll really get the neighbours staring. Top Sportages are also starting to veer into the pricing territory of the brand's largest SUV, the seven-seat Sorento, which is priced from just over £40,000 upwards and uses exactly the same engineering in play here, primarily in HEV and PHEV forms. The really important comparisons here, though, are with the differently engineered mid-sized SUVs from other brands that Kia must take on in this part of the market. Well, most of them are differently engineered anyway. The fourth generation Hyundai Tucson isn't, sharing just about everything apart from exterior and interior styling with this Sportage. But then down the years, the Tucson always has, and despite both that and market positioning, which occasionally see some Tucson variants slightly more affordably pitched than their Sportage counterparts, these two Hyundai Motor Group products have tended to appeal to slightly different customer groups. Otherwise, this Sportage's toughest competition is going to come from the established players in this part of the mid-sized SUV market, specifically volume brand ones. You could, of course, stretch to the kind of premium brand mid-sized SUV model that plusher versions of this Kia are tilting at here. Cars like Audi Q3, the BMW X1, the Jaguar E-Pace, the Volvo XC40, or for a little more, the Mercedes GLA. But all of those cars are slightly smaller than a Sportage, and you'll need a few thousand pounds more to get a level of spec comparable with an equivalent version of this Kia. So you'll not quite be comparing apples with apples. And in any case, for all its aspirations, this isn't, well, yet anyway, really a premium brand product. Instead, it more comfortably sits amongst the larger mid-sized volume brand SUV models on the market. We'll use the Sportage MHEV 48 volt mild hybrid variants as our primary point of comparison here. Variants like this test car, because those are the ones most customers are probably going to choose. Given that in this form, Sportage pricing at the time of this test started from just under £31,500. And given that, it's tempting here to think that you could save quite a lot of money over this Kia and opt for a strong class sellers like either Nissan's Qashqai or Seat's Attica you can get equivalently powered auto versions of both of these for a couple of thousand less than you'd pay for this Kia. Along with that saving though, you'd also get a slightly smaller car with less rear passenger space and a significantly smaller boot. If what you actually want is a mid-sized volume branded five-seat SUV that's really directly comparable in size, engineering and interior room to this Kia, and it's more realistic to be making your comparisons against models sized a bit more spaciously in this segment. Models that would better suit a growing family. Cars like Ford's Cougar, Volkswagen's Tiguan, Peugeot's 3008 and the Mazda CX-5. Fortunately for Kia, those brands are also pushing the boundaries of how much it's reasonable to charge for an SUV of this kind. With the result that once you've taken spec and engines into account, all of those models cost much the same as a comparable Sportage. A much cheaper MG HS wouldn't, but that's a budget brand model with a conventional petrol engine 
that's woefully inefficient. Of course, the potential alternative choices here don't end there. In your search for something more modern in this class, with a volume brand badge and technology to rival that of this Kia, you might save a little by choosing, say, a Skoda Karok, a Citroen C5 Aircross, a Jeep Compass, or a Vauxhall Grandland. But once you add in the kind of better spec that you'd probably want to give the kind of quality feel you get in this Sportage, again, the pricing probably wouldn't be that much different. In the past, we'd also have added Honda's CRV and Toyota's RAV4 to this kind of list, but those two models these days only come in self-charging full hybrid form, both priced comparably against the Sportage with the full hybrid self-charging engine. In that HEV form, just to remind you, from launch, this Kia cost from just over £33,000. The top PHEV Sportage model, of course, has its own bespoke set of rivals. And if you want it, having checked out a starting price of just under £38,500, you might immediately jump to the conclusion that several other notable mid-sized SUVs with plug-in tech are much cheaper. Cars like PHEV versions of the Ford Cougar, the Volkswagen Tiguan, the Vauxhall Grandland and the Citroen C5 Aircross. This, though, is because those models are only front-driven and they're lower-powered than a plug-in Sportage 2. Again, you need to be comparing like with like. Most plug-in mid-sized SUVs with four-wheel drive cost more than a PHEV Sportage. In some cases, a little more, like its cousin, the Hyundai Tucson plug-in hybrid, which is nearly £1,000 more in its cheapest form, or the Peugeot 3008 Hybrid 4 300, the Toyota RAV4 plug-in and the Suzuki Acros, also all slightly pricier. Other plug-in hybrids in this category, though, cost a lot more, like P300e, PHEV versions of the Range Rover Evoque and the Land Rover Discovery Sport, or PHEV versions of the Audi Q3, the Volvo XC40 and the Mercedes GLA. So, enough with comparisons. Hopefully, we've demonstrated that Kia's traditional emphasis on value is still, to some extent at least, alive and well here. If you've been convinced by that, you like the look of this Sportage and you want to know more, then you'll be needing to know just how generous the Korean maker has been with standard spec. Well, let's see. Your starting point in the range is the decision you'll make between base 2 spec or the sportier looking GT line level of trim that's based upon it. Both come with a basic spec that's, well, a bit more than basic. Think full LED auto headlamps, rain sensing wipers, power folding mirrors, all round parking sensors, a reversing camera, an alarm, a mobiliser and a wide range of camera safety features we'll get onto in a few moments. Inside, all Sportage models get Android Auto or Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring and Bluetooth with music streaming plus drive mode select drive settings, a leather steering wheel, an electrochromic mirror and a 40-20-40 split folding rear bench. That's your equipment starting point then for Sportage ownership. So which trim level should you choose at the foot of the lineup? Base 2 spec or one of the GT line variants? The two grades look quite different inside and out. Two spec models featuring the smaller size of wheel, 17 inches, and in the cabin, lacking the 12.3 inch navigation equipped central touchscreen that features elsewhere in the range. With two spec, you have to make do with a simpler 8 inch central display. All of which means that at the bottom of the lineup, if you're going to find the £3,000 extra that Kia wants from you to upgrade to GT line spec, then you'll probably want to pay it. The extra money not only gets you that larger central touchscreen and bigger wheels, 19 inches or 18 inches on the hybrid models, but also a much smarter look. GT line spec includes LED front fog lamps and rear combination lamps, rear privacy glass, a gloss black finish for the radiator grille, side sills and wheel arch body mouldings, plus body coloured door and radiator upper garnishes and a chrome skid plate front and rear. The GT line models look much nicer inside too, featuring plush suede and leather upholstery, a branded D-shaped sports leather steering wheel with perforated inserts, a black headliner, sports pedals, an aluminium pattern finish to the centre fascia and door garnishes. Plus, at this level, there's keyless entry with a start button, driver's lumbar support and cruise control with a speed limiter upgraded on DCT auto models to smart cruise control with stop and go functionality and Kia's highway driving assist semi-autonomous drive system. More on that later. 
Plus, the Kia Connect smartphone app, allowing you to remotely interact with your Sportage, which, rather meanly, Kia deletes from two-spec trim. It's standard from GT line level upwards. Kia Connect is worth telling you a bit more about. Like most branded apps of its kind, it allows user smartphones to remotely access vehicle information, such as trip data and statistics, vehicle location and vehicle lock status. Users can also check and change their vehicle settings directly from their smartphone, including navigation, radio and Bluetooth preferences. As part of the app, customers can additionally access a last mile navigation feature, which once the car's parked, will help them navigate to their final destination on foot via either Google Maps or augmented reality guidance on their smartphone. You can use the same system to help you find your parked car once you're ready to return to it. And there's a valet mode on the app that enables customers to monitor their vehicle remotely when it's being driven by someone else, which will offer added peace of mind if you've allowed your teenage son or daughter to borrow the key to your Sportage. Okay, so that's covered off what you get with the base two or GT line spec trims. What about if you can afford to spend a little more on your Sportage? Well, if so, there are two ways to go. If you're not particularly bothered about a sporty look, then you can simply build on the spec of that base two level model with plusher three or four spec variants. Alternatively, if you like the GT line trim levels dynamic look but want more equipment, then this top priciest GT line S spec level beckons. All three of these mid and top spec trim levels replace conventional analog dials with the additional 12.3 inch Supervision color cluster display for the instrument binnacle, which we think really completes the high tech look of this fifth generation models avant garde cabin. As for the trimming grade detail, well, it's best to think of the three spec model as being much the same as a GT line variant, though with a slightly less sporty look and feel. 18 rather than 19 inch wheels, for instance, and faux leather upholstery inserts replacing the suede ones inside. Three spec also gets you a couple of extra luxury touches too. Power adjustable heated front seats and a heated steering wheel. Otherwise, a three spec Sportage is trimmed very similarly to a GT line one. There's more of an equipment step up if you can afford to stretch to top four spec trim or a GT line S model like this one. In both cases, you gain dual LED adaptive headlights, a glossy black contrast colored roof, chromed skid plates front and rear, a 360 degree around view monitor, a big panorama glass sunroof, ambient lighting, a Harman Kardon premium sound system, a 15 watt wireless phone charger, an LED luggage area lamp, blind view monitor camera dials in the instrument cluster, and a package of extra camera safety features we'll brief you on in a minute. On HEV and PHEV variants, you even get a remote smart parking assist system that allows you to park the car by standing outside and maneuvering it via controls on the key fob. You'll certainly want to show your friends that. To that rather complete tally, this GT Line S trim level adds 10-way driver and 8-way passenger, electrically adjustable ventilated front seats, heated rear seats and a smart powered tailgate that you can operate with a flick of your foot beneath the bumper. On to options. Now, as usual with Kia, there aren't that many. The brand believing that customers will prefer to move up a trim level rather than go box ticking. Your dealer will, though, sell you practical items like fixed or detachable tow bars and carpet mats. If you specify the steel or aluminium roof bars, you can add a ski carrier, a bike carrier or a roof box. And to add to the look and usability of your Sportage, there are tailgate, door mirror and sideline trimming packages. Plus, if you're an extrovert sort, you can add door or bonnet decals and side steps. For the boot area, you can add a trunk liner in standard or extended form, a reversible trunk mat or a rear bumper protection foil. Bear in mind too that you'll almost certainly have to pay extra for your chosen paint colour, there's only one standard with each of the trim levels. Infrared with two, three and four spec cars or solid machine bronze for GT Line or GT Line S spec variants, which both offer a wider colour palette. Across the range, if you happen not to like the standard wheel designs, various alternative 17, 18 and 19 inch alloy rim styles are available too. 
Let's finish with a perusal of the safety stuff on offer, which remains an area where this Kia continues to easily meet the class standard. When the last generation version of this Sportage was first introduced back in 2016, it was quite rare in the segment to find a full set of camera safety features fitted right across the range. But Kia has driven sales of this model line by prioritising them. Kia has made a few little tweaks to what it now calls its DriveWise camera safety portfolio for this fifth generation model. For a start, the autonomous braking system, Kia calls its setup Forward Collision Avoidance Assist, it's got a bit cleverer, now able to detect pedestrians and cyclists and able to function at junctions if you turn out in front of an oncoming vehicle. In addition, all DCT automatic transmission versions of this Kia now get the brand's highway drive assist system, something you have to stretch right up to the pricier spec for on an equivalent Hyundai Tucson. This setup maintains the speed set by the driver or the speed limit on the motorway. At the same time, it controls steering, acceleration and deceleration in your lane while keeping a safe distance from the vehicle ahead. This feature is also designed to automatically adjust your speed based on the speed limit of the road detected through the navigation system. So if you have the speed set at 70 miles an hour on a motorway and the limit changes to 50, the car will automatically lower its speed to suit. Clever. All the usual passive safety features make the team sheet too, of course. There are twin front side and curtain airbags along with a central bag in the dashboard, though there's no driver's knee bag. Plus, you get ISOFIX rear child seat fastenings and active front head restraints that prevent whiplash. As usual with a Kia, there's the brand's VSM or Vehicle Stability Management System, which ensures stability when braking and cornering by controlling the car's ESC or Electronic Stability Control System if it detects a loss of traction. In addition, as usual with a family SUV of this kind, there's tyre pressure monitoring and hill start assist control to stop the car rolling backwards as you pull away on inclines. Downhill brake control is also included to ease you down slippery slopes. As you'd also now expect in this segment, the ABS anti-lock brakes are aided in panic stops by a brake assist feature, plus an emergency stop signal that flashes the hazard warning lights to warn following motorists. And if you fit a tow bar, there's trailer stability assist to stop trailer snaking. As we said earlier, the top four and GT Line S spec trim levels add a little extra safety kit. At this level in the range, you get blind spot collision avoidance assist, which alerts you if you're about to pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot, and a blind spot view monitor system, which uses little door mirror mounted cameras to display a side rear view image in the instrument cluster whenever you activate the indicators. You'll also be thankful for parking collision avoidance assist, which will search for potential collision hazards during low speed maneuvering, things like children, pets or low walls as well as adjacent vehicles. If something's detected that you haven't noticed, the car will automatically be braked to avoid it. It's all very reassuring. Kia's hedging its bets here. Unwilling, unlike development partner Hyundai, to completely dispense with diesel, which makes it a little more interesting in analysing questions of efficiency because it enables us to see just how close the current era of petrol engine electrification is getting towards delivering diesel-style efficiency returns. Well, the answer, if you want the headlines, is that when it comes to fuel consumption, a black pump fueled Sportage still has the measure of all its petrol-powered counterparts, bar those you can plug in. You might expect it to be a little different when it comes to questions of emissions, but in fact the diesel versions of this car significantly better the CO2 stats of a conventionally engined petrol Sportage and sit only just above those of the HEV full hybrid model. If you don't need the driving exact figures, then feel free to go and put the kettle on while we deliver them for those that do. The best returns you'll get from a diesel Sportage, predictably, come when Kia's 1.6-litre CRDI engine is embellished with the brand's 48-volt mild hybrid technology, which means you have to have specified this engine in 134 BHP form wedded to DCT auto transmission. 
In this guise, the WLTP rated stats suggest that a Sportage will deliver 54.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 135 grams per kilometer of CO2. That's a fraction better than the figures of an unelectrified, lower powered 113 bhp manual transmission Sportage 1.6 CRDI, which are 53.3 mpg and 138 grams per kilometer. For completion of this model's diesel stats, we'll tell you that when the 134 bhp 1.6 CRDI 48 volt mild hybrid model is specified with all wheel drive, the figures are 50.4 mpg and 148 grams per kilometer. Which is interesting because it enables us to make a precise comparison against the directly equivalent petrol variant we're trying here, which sees Kia's 1.6 T GDI green pump engine matched with exactly the same 48 volt electricals and on-demand all-wheel drive system. Think 40.4 mpg, which we've certainly not been getting on this test, and 158 grams per kilometer. In short then, you can see why Kia thinks that reports of diesel's demise have been greatly exaggerated. But its days are certainly numbered, or at least they will be once all the industry's petrol engines are properly electrified. The unit in question here is that 1.6 litre T GDI unit we just mentioned, which, as we explained earlier in this film, is used in all green pump fueled Sportages in some shape or form. It's a power plant crying out for some kind of electrical assistance, something you can gauge by looking at the extremely mediocre return to the entry-level petrol version of this car that does without. That model manages only 41.5 mpg on the combined cycle and a relatively smoky 154 grams per kilometer of CO2. Adding Kia's 48 volt mild hybrid system to the mix though, and with a front driven Sportage, these figures improve to 44.1 mpg and 146 grams per kilometer. Even though in 48 volt petrol form, the car must be burdened by the extra weight of DCT auto transmission. For real efficiency improvements with a green pump fueled Sportage, you'll need a full hybrid engine. One that's unlike in a mild hybrid variant like the one we're testing is able to run independently on battery power. The HEV self-charging unit fitted to the hybrid petrol model can certainly do that, though not for very long thanks to the combination of a near 1.7 tonne curb weight, a relatively feeble 60 bhp electric motor and the small size of the 1.49 kilowatt hour lithium ion polymer battery pack that powers it. Still, the front-driven HEV model's efficiency showing 49.6 mbg combined and 129 grams per kilometer of CO2 for the front-driven version, and 48.7 mpg and 132 grams per kilometer for the all-wheel drive variant, is much better than you get from a diesel rival, even a more feebly powered one. A front-driven Volkswagen Tiguan 2.0-litre TDI DSG model with just 148 bhp, for instance, 78 bhp less than a Sportage AGV, manages up to 46.3 mpg and a smoky 160 gram per kilometre with a higher tax exposure running on pricier fuel. So, unless you're planning to tow with your mid-sized SUV, maybe diesel isn't quite as good an option after all. Otherwise, with a full hybrid engine, it's all good. But not quite as good, of course, as the returns you'll get if you stump up the considerable amount extra that Kia wants for the four-wheel drive only plug-in hybrid version of this model. As we said in our driving section, the fact that with a Sportage plug-in, you get a larger 90 bhp electric motor powered by a considerably larger 13.8 kilowatt hour battery makes all the difference. And it facilitates the usual PHEV three-figure combined economy reading, in this case, 252 mpg. Along with an enviro-conscious CO2 figure of 25 grams per kilometer, Interestingly, these figures considerably improve upon those of the supposedly identically engineered Hyundai Tucson plug-in hybrid, 201.8 mpg and 31 grams per kilometer of CO2. A difference which, well, makes quite a difference because it means that the Sportage PHEV qualifies for a lower 8% benefiting kind taxation band. For comparison, a Tucson plug-in hybrid is rated at 12%. 
Either way, the BIK tax savings are massive over a version of this car you can't plug in. Even the supposedly green-minded Sportage HEV hybrid is rated up at 32%. That means someone paying 40% income tax would save around £3,000 a year in company car tax by choosing a PHEV Sportage rather than an HEV hybrid one. You'd quite quickly make back the PHEV model's £5,000 asking price increment on that basis. All food for thought. Both the HEV and PHEV Sportage models have dedicated sections on the car's centre dash screen that allow you to monitor your ongoing progress in efficiency. And the plug-in hybrid model's PHEV section is particularly good in that regard. Go to Eco Driving and you'll find fuel economy graphs showing average MPG for both fuel engine and electric motor use. And a history section showing driving dates, distances and energy consumption for your last 30 trips. Another part of the PHEV section menu is energy info, which shows your total remaining driving range, electric and fuel, and your current battery percentage charge. Ah yes, charging. Now with a plug-in Sportage, you'll want to know more about that. This model has a 7.2 kilowatt onboard charger and can be charged from a three-pin ICCB supply in six hours and 30 minutes from empty to 95%. Use the kind of seven kilowatt wall box you'd obviously install at home if you were to choose a plug-in hybrid and that time drops to one hour and 42 minutes. That PHEV screen we just referenced offers more help here. And the energy info section gives charging times from AC stations based on the current state of your battery. A charge management section allows you to change charging settings and current levels. And a useful EV range section shows you in map form how far your current driving range will take you and offers a list option which shows you your nearest public charging stations. When you're plugged in at home, you can remotely schedule charging via your smartphone and an available Kia Connect app so that the battery's replenished during low demand hours for lower electricity rates. Whatever Sportage drivetrain and power plant you choose, to help you get somewhere close to the quoted fuel figures, you'll need to keep this Kia as regularly as possible in eco drive mode, which slightly restricts throttle travel and climate system output. In a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid model, if the battery is charged, you can also switch to full electric mode, which will take you hardly any distance at all in the hybrid. But in the plug-in, will allow the car to travel at up to 43 miles on battery power alone, which is five more miles than the identically engineered Hyundai Tucson plug-in hybrid can manage, and a range potential we found to be surprisingly achievable. Kia suggests that sticking to an urban environment could actually see this figure climb to over 45 miles before the engine would have to cut in. Right, on to issues of VED road tax. Again, there are big advantages here with hybrid drive. For the HEV full hybrid model, you'll pay £180 in year one. To give you some perspective, the owner of a base unelectrified Sportage 1.6 TGDI would be paying £585 in VED for the same period, it'll be £230 for the MHEV model. Choose the Sportage PHEV and in year one of ownership you won't have to make any VED payments at all. Bear in mind that any car that costs more than £40,000, as 4-spec and GT Line S-spec Sportage PHEV models do, is liable for an additional £335 payment the first five times the tax is renewed. You'll also want to know about likely depreciation with a volume brand badged large SUV of this kind of price. Well, that's reasonably class competitive. Industry experts reckon that after three years and 60,000 miles, the Sportage 1.6 T GDI 48 volt GT Line S DCT all wheel drive model we're trying here would still be worth 45.4% of its original value, which is very class competitive. On to warranties. Now, Kia used to lead the industry here with its seven-year, 100,000-mile deal, but now things aren't quite as clear-cut, though it's useful that you can continue to transfer the cover to future owners. If in future the car is sold through a Kia used to prove dealership when less than 18 months old or with less than 18,000 miles on the clock, the warranty will be topped up to match that of a new model. That really shows confidence in your product. But other brands are catching up in this area. 
the package you get with a rival Hyundai Tucson is only five years, but puts no limitation on mileage. Alternatively, if you were to choose a similarly priced Toyota RAV4 hybrid, you could extend the car's standard three-year warranty cover for up to 10 years, with an extra year's warranty added every time you got it serviced at a franchise dealer. With this Kia, as you'd expect, there is also a 12-year anti-perforation and five-year paint warranty to even further cement the longevity of the car. Servicing is every 10,000 miles, and should those mileages not be achieved, then servicing is still required annually. And, as usual with a kit, you can budget ahead with prepaid servicing plans, courtesy of the brand's Care 3 package that offers a fixed price deal covering your first three garage visits, a package that can be extended to include five visits if you go for the upgraded Care 3 Plus option. In addition, a customer can now purchase services up to and including the seventh one, so matching the full length of the warranty. Whatever plan you go for, you can also bundle an MOT test in with it, and on that basis you'll have the peace of mind of knowing that virtually all maintenance costs will probably have been covered for the entire time that your name will be on the logbook. Usefully, the car's centre screen has a vehicle diagnostic section that allows you to check various maintenance functions between services, the brakes, the indicators, the steering, camera safety systems and tyre pressures. Insurance ratings are, for ridiculous reasons best known to Thatcham, significantly higher than those of an identically engineered Hyundai Tucson. For a diesel, grouping starts at 15E or 16E for the 1.6 CRDI 113BHP model. It's group 18E or 19E for the faster, more frugal 1.6 CRDI 134BHP 48V DCT auto diesel versions. For petrol people, Sportage grouping starts at 17 or 18E for the base 1.6T GDI engine. Get a Sportage 1.6T GDI 48V DCT auto model and it's Group 19E or Group 20E for this all-wheel drive variant. The HEV hybrid is rated at between Groups 24E to 25E depending on trim and this PHEV model is rated at Group 24E to 26E. In theory, a lot of boxes have been ticked here. This fifth generation Sportage looks more striking and has been aligned in size more closely to the needs of our market. It offers new full hybrid and plug-in hybrid engine options in a class where rivals typically only provide either one or the other. And the smart cabin finally puts pay to any memory of Kia's budget brand roots. But the South Korean makers now not afraid to charge decent money for this car. Prices have risen significantly to pay for all those improvements, which might not be so difficult to accept if this Kia was a little more cutting edge in terms of its drive dynamics. For many customers, though, the handling responses will be secondary and the pricing impact will be lessened by monthly finance figures softened by the tax advantages of this model line's newfound standards of electrification. These people will be more interested in the significant steps forward taken here, the extra passenger room, the bigger boot and the big advance in media connectivity, all of which is just as well, for this Kia must now face a set of very determined rivals, not least its identically engineered cousin, the Hyundai Tucson, and Nissan's Qashqai, the segment sales leader. This Sportage, though, having long been edging closer to that Japanese arch rival, now feels ready to bother it more acutely in this fifth generation form, which means that if you're shopping in this segment, this Kia remains a car you simply have to try.